gate. There's no track of a hedge, no trace of a fence. In the middle of a field, an iron gate, and no evidence of path or passage. It clings to rusty hinges on chiseled stone. It hardly infringes on the course of stock. For cattle, a pair of scratching posts. For the colt and chestnut mare, a nuzzling place where you pause and again you contemplate in the middle of open grazing your fate by a gate that stops nothing and points nowhere. Say for a moment the field is your life and you come to a gate at the center of it. What then? Then you pause and open it and enter. As you heard, um, I grew up on a farm in the Irish Midlands. I was away for some years at boarding school uh, and then at Trinity College from where I started looking for a place near the home place. And, uh, found a house, saw a house one day, and knew that it was where my life should be centered. And I've lived in that house ever since. Um, and for about 15 years, I farmed as well as trying to work on poems and um, put together books by other writers, uh, mostly raising sheep. And a lot of the poems record incidents in that life and that world. Um, this is a poem that goes back in memory to the boyhood place in which I grew up, and it moves from there to more contemporary times and concerns. Um, I grew up when horns hadn't been bred out of cattle and milk cows. Um, and then a law was introduced that uh, the horns had to be cut off the cattle um, by hand, by ways that would seem crude now, perhaps. Um, and it was called sculling. Uh, and the man who came to do this was a sculler. Um, this poem is called Law. I love it in one way when the room is packed, but uh, I recognize the disadvantages too. Um, <laughs> law. Man handled in the crush. They ball brute force against the iron bars, gates at the gable end of the stable row. My uncle single signaled yonder. I climbed five bars beyond harm's way, for now by law they'd to be sculled. He came all set to work with work coat and squat saw. He took them on one by one, one side, then the other. It was childhood, shock, and awe. Shorthorn, Frisian, Whitehead, Kerry Blue. These are breeds of cattle that we had. And I, I, it struck me earlier that uh, what we call Frisian is more commonly called Holstein over here, the black and white common milk cow. Shorthorn, Frisian, Whitehead, Kerry Blue. Cut horns amassed like battle trophies in the slush. A sudden daub of powder on the round rows of each wound, the snort and grunt of pain, each one an injured able to arcane. And then that rush of blood when he slashed through a vessel, 
that pulsing arc that splashed our hands and arms and faces and made muck blush, all brought back to me by a footnote to the latest slaughter in Iraq, where some of those that lived envied some that didn't. In a photograph, a boy the age that I was then with half a head whose skull was shorn beneath the ear straight through bone. The gore coagulated on a lack. And then I saw his hands were joined as if in prayer and arms were chained behind his back and now met then when none of us was not bloodstained. Um, Joseph uh, made reference to a translation I published some years ago um, of Virgil's beautiful poem, The Georgics. Um, this is a poem from 2,000 years ago, 2,200 lines, um, a poem about people trying to re-establish their lives in the aftermath of a Roman civil war. And I want to read a bit of it in particular today because in the course of that semester I spent here in 2000, uh, though I had been hovering around the poem for some time before that, uh, yeah. in the house on North Blackfriar Street, um, upstairs, I found the kind of key to the opening of the poem that set me on my way with the translation. Um, sometime later, I was working on the end of book one, um, and it was a time of extreme turmoil in the world, um, disregarding completely a UN resolution. Your president of the time couldn't but rush into uh, Iraq, and turmoil followed from that, uh, which seemed to be echoed in these lines from the end of a poem written, as I say, before the birth of Christ. In short, whatever evening's bringing on, whence winds propel fair weather clouds, and what wet southerlies portend, the sun will advance warning signs. Who'd dare to question the sun's word? For it is he once more who forestalls troubles, hidden but at hand, of conflicts festering out of sight. And it was he who felt for Rome that time that Caesar fell and veiled his gleaming head in gloom so dark the infidels began to fear that night would last forever. The skies of Germany resounded with the din of war. Weird stirrings caused the Alps to tremble. What's more, in quiet groves, a voice was heard by many peoples, a monstrous voice, and pallid specters loomed, though through the dead of night, and, dare I say it, cattle spoke. The rivers ground to a halt, gaping holes appeared, and in the sanctuary carved ivories began to weep the tears of mourning, and bronzes to perspire. The Po, King River, swept away in raging rushes across the open plains whole plantations, cattle, and their stalls swept all away. That was a time when entrails, carefully scrutinized, showed nothing but the worst, and wellsprings spouted blood all day, and hill towns howled all night with wolves. Nothing surer then the time will come when in those fields a farmer plowing will unearth 
rough and rusted javelins and hear his heavy hoe echo on the sides of empty helmets and stare in open-eyed amazement at the bones of heroes he's just happened on. For right and wrong are mixed up here. There's so much warring everywhere. Evil has so many faces and there is no regard for labors of the plow. Bereft of farmers, fields have run to a riot of weeds. Look here, the east is up in arms. Look there, hostilities in Germany. Neighboring cities reneged on what they pledged and launch attacks. The whole world's at loggerheads, a blasphemous battle as when right from the ready, steady, go, chariots quicken on a track until the driver hasn't a hope of holding the reins and he's carried away by a team that pays heed to nothing, wildly away and no control. Um, <coughs> Kathy Staples, um, showed me some papers that some of you perhaps here have written on poems of mine, um, which is a humbling and daunting and, I mean, even if they were written to order, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be pleased. Um, but I thought immediately of, of, I think the first time someone showed me a paper that a student had written on my work. Um, and it was on the topic assigned was Peter Fallon as a nature poet or something. Uh, and this person, though I was told she was a very bright student, um, hadn't mastered um, the switch for spell check. And her whole paper came out as uh, nature poetry and Peter Falcon. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so I'm going back to one of those poems that I, I believe was uh, part of that course. Um, I mentioned the husbandry of sheep and raising a small flock as I did for 15 years. Uh, there was a time I seemed to write more poems about sheep than people, um, <laughs> but I saw more sheep than people in those years. Um, and this is one of these a sonnet um, that starts with that moment when a lamb is stillborn and leaves its mother, what we call a yo, uh, with milk. And around the same time, uh, a yo that hasn't milk gives birth to lambs. And Frequently, we would try to make a match between the living lamb and the yo with milk. Sometimes they take to each other simply, easily. Other times, it's harder to get them together. Uh, what you need is, is the lamb to, to suck and feed once, and then that bond is shaped. Um, and sometimes, we would resort to skinning the dead lamb and wrapping that skin around the living one so that the sheep would smell her offspring and let the match be made. Um, and after doing this one time, uh, I, I don't know why it came to me, but that story you'll know from the Bible of um, the twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah um, Esau and Jacob. Do some of you remember this? We're told that one of these boys was uh, smooth-skinned and the other was rough-skinned, a man of the fields. And uh, when Isaac is dying, he's blind, he is going to pass on his <coughs> inheritance to, to one of these sons. And the smooth-skinned son conspires with his mother to pretend he is the other by 
uh, putting, as I remember it, on the back of his palms and his neck, some parts of a goat skin. And Isaac says, y you don't sound like the son you say you are. Come. And he embraces him, and he feels um, this skin on his hands and neck. Um, fostering. Um, there's a word in the poem, spins, which is a, a local word in North Meath uh, for the teat. Um, I, I don't know that it's used in other parts or places. Um, <coughs> he was lost in the blizzard of himself and lay a cold white thing in a drift of afterbirth. Another stood to drink dry spins. I put him with the foster yo who sniffed and butted him from his birthright, her milk. I took the stillborn lamb and cleft with axe and chopping block its head, four legs, and worked the skin apart with deft skill and rough strength. I dressed the living lamb in it. It stumbled with the weight, all pluck, towards the yo who sniffed and smelled and licked raiment she recognized. Then she gave suck, and he was Esau's brother, and I, Isaac's wife, working kind betrayals in a field blessed for life. This is a poem that starts late afternoon, early evening, at home, in Loch Crewe, just watching that daily migration of crows from their feeding grounds, heading uh, towards their nest, flying over the house, uh, pausing on a, a row of lime trees, uh, gathering, grumbling, arguing, and then continuing to where they nest. Um, it's called an outlook. They have ruffled the embers of evening and flap from its flames. They come like clockwork minutes later every eventide, a loud returning that proclaims the row of limes in which they pause en route to roosting in the rookery, a place of rest. They sketch black scripture in the sky. They watch from trees where they don't nest. These pairs and threes, tens and dozens, making thousands. While I, intent on praise and mesmerized, wonder what, as they fly by, they might be and realize they are the days. Um, our daughter is um, the age, I'm guessing, of uh, many of you here. Um, this is a poem I, I wrote some years ago when suddenly she was growing to that point where she was beginning to encounter the world on her own terms, um, and our place was to stand back and let go um, and try to convey a sense that we're here if you need us. Um, that time of just confronting things through her own eyes rather than 
through the veil of the care of parents, I guess. And it's called A Summer Flood. Again, I went out to the new wood because at times as these, it is a true good to be alone among the trees I planted and transplanted and an ease among steadfast companions to be one who believes that answers can emerge in leaves. There was disquiet in the house, a whirlwind in the ways and days of our most lovely girl. They stroked her like water, that is, everywhere, the worries, and the woes, first deaths, her teenage tragedies. How live two lives of here and there, wherever there may be? May she pause, I make my prayer, like salmon in the estuary, our daughter, acclimatizing too fresh water en route towards a stay in gravelly mud and waiting for a summer flood to tide them over. Now contrails scratch the sky. In June I watch the mayfly hatch. And then what had been leafage in the night began to ruffle feathers, ready to take flight and birdsong happened for me. No, for us all. Solo first, then in chorus. I'd like to read three or four more. Um, but it strikes me, it, I'm, I'm maybe failing in, in, uh, to, to address that question of poems to, to read. Um, without this sounding terrible or corny, I mean, if there is a poem someone would like to hear, um, I would love if that person would speak or wave or um, let me know. There's no point afterwards in saying, I wish you'd read something, you know? Um, is there a poem anyone wants to, I mean, we're all friends, don't be shy. Um, <laughs> let me know. Um, the Thorn Wire. Well, that's a long one. Um, oh, all right. Um, I don't know, it seems to be. <laughs> you seem happy to tell us. Uh, anything else troubling you? <laughs> um, barbed wire, uh, at home we call thorn wire. Um, and this makes, this first section, which I'll read. Um, I mean the, the poem is in seven, I think, parts and uh, by starting um, to just dwell on barbed wire or thorn wire um, because one day I noticed a scar here that was a result, uh, the, this first section describes what happened and I, I noticed the scar and I started remembering what caused this mark uh, was barbed wire and then I, I just, kind of traced barbed wire through uh, centuries. And it occurs and um, it became a kind of emblem for me of his history and conflict and those miles and miles of barbed wire on the uh, front lines of the First World War, um, the miles and miles of wire when the, the, the prairies of this great nation was uh, 
being fenced for the first time and the divisions that that caused. And again and again, barbed wire seemed to surface. Um, but let me just say wh where the takeoff for, for that kind of contemplation was began. You've pile-driven the posts. The sledge would splinter or split. You fastened one end to the strainer and unrolled and unraveled the other 80 yards of it. On the top of that run of sheep fencing, you're stretching a, stringled, a single strand when it unleashes its attack. A, cool, a coiled cobra springs, snags, and rips raw lumps from the back of your bare hand, ungloved to grip wet staples. I saw blood flow, but had no feeling. In the teeth of rain, my crumpled palm brimmed like stigmata. I saw bone, an etch on it, pain prostered on the bud of healing. A stain on my smudged cheek across my jaw. Blood coursed the slope of folded fingers and gleamed on brutal barbs. Three decades on, a scar remains. Proud flesh, a badge of that skirmish with the devil's rope. Um, Is there anyone else who thinks of a poem or has a poem in mind? Um, I read uh, A Summer Flood um, with our daughter in mind. Um, this, A Far Cry, um, in some way, is a companion piece for our son, who's a little older than she. Um, the poem makes, makes reference to Loch Crew, which is the townland in which uh, my home is, and it is the center, the element in which I feel uh, in many ways most at home. But I can say that because I get away from it uh, regularly, and it's a good place to go back to. Um, there's reference also to Polonius, uh, and you'll remember Polonius, the counselor to the king in Hamlet, the father of Ophelia and Laertes. This is all going to come up in the quiz afterwards. Um, uh, and Hamlet unknowingly kills him, which triggers Ophelia's madness uh, and the duel between Laertes and the prince at the end of the play. Um, I mean, Polonius became a kind of byword for waffle and blather. Um, he's referred to as a tedious old fool. Um, but occasionally, he came out with uh, words of some wisdom and uh, good advice. A far cry. Let each step be a prayer and not escape. Even if you'd venture to the far ends of the earth, dare to walk on air. Chance turning a blind eye to the present moment, and you might miss your proper life. Be patient as the mare beneath her fly mantilla. Be still in tender time. Along the riverbank, dark birds extend their wings in versions of surrender. And then, when they take off, they soar. Heed their sermons. Heed morning's constant benedictions, winds' histories. 
bend, don't break. Credit that part of you that hopes to be haunted or lies submerged like the three streams of Loch Crew, whose principles are graven in your bone. Bear with this Polonius and trust the heart. The heart's a haven. You wonder if you're seeing things as you awaken to the need to dream new maps into being. Choose quietude. Don't shy from silence. World needs be no more than itself. Imagine. Abjure the social violence that has fractured families, homes, and hearts. We let go the loved one, not the love, and shattered whole communities. Say never again to the wild Irish rover, no more to the minstrel boy. Give us back our sons and daughters. Say that Ireland is over. Um, and two more poems, if I may. Um, I started th this poem about four years ago. Um, I'll read it uh, as an elegy now. It's called The Then and Now. So little now and so much then. Her new address is age in courage. She has been leaving us since when? Good woman and just citizen who mined the golden ore of courage, so little now and so much then. Her wisdom of fourscore and ten bypasses any rage in courage. She has been leaving us since when? Her children and her grandchildren help her to scale the crag of courage. So little now and so much then. Her widowhood sustains a zen-like calm in the cage of courage. She has been leaving us since when? The word she'd say now is amen, epitome of grace in courage. So little now and so much then, she has been leaving us since when? Um, I'd like to finish. Um, with a poem that's called A Family Tie. Um, may I repeat thanks to Joseph for his welcome, the door he keeps open here, um, to the university for the Heimbold chair. Um, a terrific young novelist, Claire Kilroy, will come in January. Um, to my old, old friends here, Jim and Kathy, to my director, uh, Kathy Staples, um, but to all of you for attention, and uh, I thank you for listening. Um, a family tie. She lit the candles of kindness, one by one, until her pray for me, and my unuttered, I will mind you in the only state, time is safe, 
that is memory. Your haunting by a younger self tests a courage to keep faith when so much disappears. Friends to age, the land itself, the waves that weep on one lake shore leave the other wet with tears. All that was long before I learned, if I've learned anything, because I read a sign that any life might be the same length as a strand of twine. Time, is it? Or time that's left? The hours in which we partake are but a trick of retrospect and longing. When you left home, it was I who was homesick. Now what was and is have separated, but are still twins within that mystery of time, or time and place, as if a place had but a single history, for it was not a letting go, no, more a series of sheddings. How often have I quoted her, you can't dance at all the weddings, now you chase your hearts and aces, the days bequeath but brittle traces. We might grow by healing, be strong, my love, in the broken places. I'd wake and want to give the ordinary day its due. Who enters age amenably? Who but a lucky few complete their lives. It's true. I'd seek the makings of a summer in a single swallow. Do good work, <coughs> I'd tell myself, and the rest will follow. Peter, a bit about reconciling your work as an editor with being a poet or in terms of doing your, your own work. Do you become an editor or do you I, I, I hope so. Um, I'm not sure, um, th this is a hot debate about whether you can teach creative writing, but I have no doubt that you can help people to learn how to read better. And I think for any writer, it is crucial that you learn at some point to step outside the work and, and read it to make sure that uh, what you thought you were saying is what you say. Um, and um, a lot of my time is, is spent working with other writers on books and on their texts. We, we work very closely together. Um, and I hope that I am a supportive, cheerleading, critical reader of that work. And uh, I hope in some way I'm helping them to, to read the work, um, to see it from a different perspective. Um, and yes, I mean, I hope I apply that to myself. Um, I mean, it can happen easily that, that you think you've said something you haven't. Um, there's a terrific early poem by Paul Muldoon, a poet I revere, um, one, of, one of my close, close friends. Um, and I remember reading this poem with some students once. Um, and it's a poem called Identities. And it, it's, it's like a kind of film from uh, the 50s or something. You imagine black and white film of people uh, trying to cross borders and arrange papers and everything. Um, but it starts. Um, and I was reading the poem with these students, and I, I thought it was pretty straightforward, uh, at the beginning at least. Um, and it uses that colloquial phrase, um, to fall in with another. 
and used to this phrase. So mm -hmm. He fell in with a bad crowd. He fell, you know, he fell in with another. Um, and the poem starts, um, when I reached the harbor, I fell in with another. And, and these people proceed through the poem. And I thought, this is straightforward enough. And a student I had was completely baffled by it. And I said, well, what's wrong here? Um, he said, just don't get it. And I said, what don't you get? And he said, when I reached the harbor, I fell in with another. Um, <laughs> he had him in the water. Um, and he's right, you know? And of course, Muldoon was thrilled to hear this. Um, uh, and maybe, you know, if, if you were reading from all angles, you might have picked that up, and you might have taken the chance on it anyway. But um, you hope, as an editor, to be, do you use that phrase here, invisible mending, repairing? No. Um, yes. Yes. You know what I mean by invisible mending? Um, and I think editing should be a kind of invisible mending, in the sense that if, if, if you can see the repair work, it hasn't been done. Uh, wow. So would you have changed I fell in with if you had been helping him edit? Well, <coughs> maybe not, because I, I think the colloquial tone, um, I think often the, 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 the guiding help that we have is the phrase, um, we're all used to the phrase, the mind's eye. You see things in the mind's eye. But I don't think we use enough uh, the notion of the mind's ear. So that even if you're not saying something aloud, you are hearing it. And I think uh, the mind's ear, in a case like that, would have gone with the idiom, the colloquial of falling in with another. Sometimes you just take your chances with these things. Peter, are there, um, over the years, have there been American poets that you have been particularly responsive to? Yeah, many. Um, uh, I was at college the first time that I was invited to, to come to do a reading in this country. And it was in western Massachusetts, parts you know well, Brook Farm. Um, further west than that, uh, and it was April, um, end of winter, and I had just this uncanny sense of familiarity with the territory, and I, I couldn't work it out. And then I just realized, Robert Frost gave me this many times, I mean, I'd been reading him, and it was a true landscape. But beyond that, I became friendly with a number of American poets who became more than friends, more than people that I admired. Um, they became kind of beacons of my life in, in some way. Um, because what I was, though much of our literature in, in Ireland, contemporary writing, uh, dwells on a kind of rural or farm past. Seamus Heaney's poems are full of that first life uh, in Mossbourne and Malahi and County Derry. But he was away from it. Uh, John Montague writes about a farming background in the north of Ireland. I mean, many people do. Uh, but I was trying to practice farming and more engaged with the natural world in some way than they were. And I wasn't finding equivalents in Ireland, but I was in North America. Um, Gary Snyder was an important presence and poet to me. Um, and I was a thrill when he came to Loch Crew one time when we had a couple of days together there. Uh, and my enduring friendship here is with Wendell Berry. And, uh, that's been 
a fortifying, confirming thing for me. I just admire him absolutely as man, writer, um, author, uh, and, uh, you name it, he's all of those things, writing poems or play, um, poems or stories or novels or essays um, and farming from farm, uh, a very important figure for me. Donald Hall is a figure in New Hampshire who's meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, I mean, quite a number. Um, Um, I think, speaking of the ear, I detected quite a few of your poems were in form. Formal. I'm wondering how you decide between writing in three verse piece. Well, um, I'm not sure what free verse is. <laughs> and uh, I mean, as you know, famously, um, Robert Frost referred to. Uh, certain kinds of writing as being like playing tennis without a net. Um, form, for some people, is a four-letter word that begins with F. Uh, <laughs> and um, for many people, it, 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 it seems something that's too hard um, you know, to start rhyming something or writing in lines of, of equally measured pitch. Uh, and then to have to keep going with that, you know, and if there might be a shortcut or something. But I, I find myself thinking, uh, if it isn't in form of some kind, what is it? It is formless. And is that what you want? Um, so I'm not saying everything should rhyme. I'm not saying everything should be in uh, I am a tetrameter. I'm not saying everything should be um, sustenance. I'm, I'm not saying anything like that. But I think if you're writing poems, something has to govern a line. Something has to distinguish it from a prose line. And often, what governs a line is back to sound, our voice. A correspondence between an idea and, and, and the phrase or the breath that might articulate that. Um, and form, of course, can go too far. And uh, I mean, for some people, it's, it's entirely unnatural. It's constricting. As, uh, I have that image of uh, those kind of Victorian corsets <laughs> that people used to strap themselves into. Uh, made of whalebone and the like, uh, and to tie themselves so tight to the point that they couldn't breathe, they broke ribs, you know. The, uh, and form can be that for some people. Um, but however long we would talk about this, we would never get to a point of saying uh, there is one way of doing it, and it has to be this. And, it is open and, I mean, the, within the poetry of this country in the last 50 years, um, the, the formal poets became kind of, uh, it was kind of a bad word nearly, um, in the whole expanse and explosion and burst of energy into other adventures in writing. Um, but there were people who were masters of form, who just kept doing it and didn't care. I mean, I'm thinking of, of someone like Richard Wilbur, who's just a glorious, glorious poet. And he was out of fashion, but he didn't care. He just kept doing it. And, and those poems uh, would endure um, as, as pure things. And, and if, if I, I think Wilbur is a terrific poet. We have a kind of equivalent, um, a poet called Derek Mahan, who writes a classical verse, subject matter that is completely up to the moment, but formally 
uh, there are poems that, that could have been written by Philip Sidney centuries ago. And I sometimes think if someone said to me, I just, I don't get poetry. I don't get poetry. Um, I think you could start with someone like Richard Wilbur, or you could start with Janet Mann and say, listen to it, hear it, see images, see patterns of words, see, um, it, it, is there not something to admire about the way this has been made? Um, I mean, I love that old Scots word for the poet, which was the maker. William Dunbar's terrific elegy for the lament for the makar, as he called it, the maker. Um, and the poem is, in my view, a composition of different things. And the decision to exclude certain things as well. Um, but it is, I kind of envy dramatists that word that they have, playwright, the right, the, as in the maker, the, the wheelwright, the wainwright, the, car, the cartwright, uh, the playwright, the person who makes the play. I, I kind of would like. We were poem writers. <laughs> but I enjoy rhymes. I enjoy um, patterns of order. Um, I know other people work differently. Um, and what do you ask? Uh, determines it. Um, it is something to do with the first sound, the note that you hear first in a line or in an idea. Um, I mean, at some point, you have an idea or an image and you find words for it. And they come with various things going on already. It, it could be the speed of them, a kind of tempo, or it could be a length and you build on that. Um, so I don't want to say something as cute as I, I don't choose them, they choose me. Or, but they are born of something. Um, there is a beginning that, that says, maybe this one should be this way. Um, but one of the alarming lessons of my life is that uh, I thought You'd practice writing poems, you'd, you'd work at poems, you'd eventually get to the point of knowing how to write poems. And it has struck me that you don't learn how to write poems. If, if, if you're lucky, you learn how to write the poem you're working on at that time. And when that's finished, and you don't know anything, you just start again. It wasn't what I was hoping to learn, um, <laughs> but I believe it to be true, and it's true for me. Did you have a question? Yes, sure. yeah, I have a question about your interest in Latin poets and authors. How did that get started? And when you like make an attribution to a poet, a Latin, you know, like a Latin poet from centuries ago, yeah. is it a direct translation or is it are you inspired by it? Well, and why not be with poetry? Has that affected your work? Um, start with the, the Latin. I, I, at boarding schools, learned Latin from when I was nine or something. And uh, when I met the Georgics first, it astonished me that here was a poem about sheep and cattle and things that I knew about. Here was a poem with a subject matter that wasn't literary only. It was looking in a mirror in some way. And I hovered around the Georgics for decades, literally. I could go back to it, um, attracted to parts of it. Um, 
and it got to the stage where I thought, well, I, I believe that an act of translating depends on some affinity between um, the person translating and, and the original. Um, but it, it's an act of reading, really. It's an act of very close reading. And I thought I wanted to read the Georgics closely. Um, and I thought there might be passages in it that I would plunder and uh, translate. And I, I mean, I wasn't even thinking of publication, but I did some of this. And then I began to realize, one, I wanted to read more and deeper. And two, that to take some of these passages, I would need to read the whole lot anyway to establish a whole context for me. Um, I had to kind of teach myself Latin again to do it. Um, and I started out thinking that Georgics is a beautiful poem. And I ended knowing it is. Um, I, I'm never tired of it. I, I miss it. I, I actually want to go back to it. Um, there's a mistake in it um, that I made, and I can't understand why. There's nothing in the drafts that tells me why I did one thing a particular way. So I kind of have a feeling I need to go back and do it again. Um, but one thing I learned, uh, and it surprised me, if you publish a translation, you're immediately asked, what are you going to translate next? And I thought, nothing. I mean, I'm not a translator. Um, I just wanted to do the Georgics. Um, but of course, as soon as I had said that, I thought, now I can go and look at Hesiod and the Works and Days, which is 800 years older, uh, but was a kind of model for Virgil except it's in Greek, and I have not one word of Greek. Um, so I read every version I could find, and I made a version um, several years ago. And I just decided it's not that good. Um, and then I decided maybe that's not all my fault. And I have, I'm, I'm not a classical scholar enough to be sure of this. But something tells me what, what we call works and days is not all the work of one writer. It's not all the same man or mind. Um, and I wonder if that's part of the problem. And recently, two Greek scholars asked if they might work with me trying to identify what makes me think that these are in a different key, if you like. Um, and then they might see it as a way of that's impossible. So I'd go back to it. But more recently, I found um, a poet of contemporary of Virgil's called Tibullus. Um, and I, trans I, I translated a couple of very short pieces by him, and then two longer pieces, which in strong one love. Um, Tibullus, in, in that age of everyone seeking fame in battle and uh, wanting fame on earth and fame in the afterlife, Tibullus uh, more or less said to his patron, you go off, fight those wars. That's what you want to do. I want to stay here with my girl. Uh, and uh, I don't want to work. I just want to lay about. So, of course, instant affinity. Um, 